Welcome to lecture number six in vehicle propulsion system where we will look at supervisory control algorithms and use them for developing control strategies that can be used online in vehicles. We will start with a little bit of repetition then we will go into energy management systems and talk about the supervisory control algorithms and we will look a little bit at heuristic control approaches then we will go into more theoretically founded approaches such as optimal control strategies and look at analytical solutions to the optimal energy management problems. And finally we'll talk a little bit about plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and discharging strategies for them. You have worked now with a parallel hybrid where you have two parallel energy paths. You have one degree of freedom that's one state, namely state of charge of the battery. And we can use that state of charge to optimize the fuel economy of the vehicle. Uh, you have also worked with the serial hybrid where we have one part where the operation of the engine is decoupled through the battery and power electronics. We have two states in the QSS framework, it's state of charge and engine speed. And as you know now from hand in assignment number two, this is a quite more difficult problem to solve because we have more degrees of freedom. We are also utilizing optimization in the process of improving the fuel economy of vehicles and you have seen already one example where we looked at the gear ratio optimization to see how can we adjust the gear ratios to get the lowest fuel consumption over a given drive cycle. That problem is presented in appendix 8.1 and the problem characteristics in normal optimization is that we have a countable number of free variables. So the free variables in this case are fives, but you could also have several hundreds or thousands of free variables in optimization problems. We have a cost function which we can compute. We have a set of constraints which we can evaluate to see if it fulfills our desired properties. And then we formulate the problem to minimize the total fuel as a function of the five decision variables. And we need to make sure that the model and the cycle is fulfilled. When we come to optimal control, we can look at the optimal driving of a vehicle where we have a natural cost function, which is the total mass of fuel consumed. Then we have a fuel mass flow model, which depends on the gas pedal position and the vehicle velocity. And that's essentially the engine efficiency model. Then we have constraints and the constraints in optimal control are the differential equations. So the main thing that differs between normal optimization and optimal control is that we have an infinite dimensional decision variable. And as constraint, we have the differential equation. For example, we need to follow Newton's law for the vehicle acceleration. And we also integrate the position from the velocity. Then we have also additional constraints. We have a starting point at one point and we have a final point where we want to go. We also have limits on the control action that the gas pedal can be fully up or fully pressed. And in the driving there are also speed limits that are path constraints. This was the motivation. The general problem formulation, we have a cost function that can have two terms. We have one integral term that we for example use to integrate up the fuel flow so that we get the fuel mass and we could also have a final cost depending on where we are so if we have a certain deviation we could penalize that for example if we have a certain place we want to be we can give that cost zero and then if we are at a point away from that we can penalize that deviation we have the dynamic system model that are constraints and uh, we also have an initial point at this state x and then we have control constraint and state or path constraint. When we come to optimal control we have then this problem formulation. When we're going to solve this optimal control problem we can use dynamic programming as we have been working with in the hand in assignment number two. There you have set up the problem formulation you and we search an approximation to the solution by discretizing the state space and also maybe the control signal in both amplitude and time and the result is a combinatorial network problem and the network you see here 
and the problem is to take us from starting point to the end point. You know now that the algorithm I use is that we start at the end and then we proceed backwards in time and we build up an optimal cost to go function. That cost to go function we later use to unwind the solution and to get the information about what's the best way of reaching the end point. It can also be used in theory which we will see in the final slide of this presentation. When we look at the results we can get from such a solver we have uh, this example here where we are driving over the European city cycle and we can see the electric usage and we can see the combustion engine usage at different occasions. It's a very powerful tool to, to get insight into optimal energy management. Coming to the new topic, energy management system, supervisory control algorithms. What we are going to work with is select how much energy we should take from the battery when we look at vehicles desired propulsive power. We have already gone through these, but we have the all electric mode where all power is taken from the battery out to the vehicle. Then in battery recharge mode we take energy from the combustion engine to recharge the battery while we're still driving the vehicle and we have power assist mode where we do electric boosting so this is favorable for the case where we have done a downsizing to gain fuel economy and we can increase the drivability and performance of the vehicle by combining both power sources. So we have regenerative braking where we, we take the kinetic energy and we place that kinetic energy in the battery and then we have conventional vehicle mode. Now we'll talk about how should we do this distribution here. From the driver's gas pedal there comes a demand that wants to drive forward and we are now in the process of trying to find out how much should we use from the combustion engine or the battery. Here we have a parallel hybrid vehicle where we have the combustion engine and the gearbox, the electric motor and the battery. And the battery provides a feedback path here that tells whether it's low or high charge in the battery. This is important for making the selection. If we have high charge then it's possible to utilize more electric energy and uh, if we are low on the state of charge then we should prioritize taking energy from the combustion engine. So we're determining this kind of power split and we can have different options with clutch engagement or we can decouple the engine entirely. We have some strategies for the parallel hybrid where we have the power split, we have the clutch and the engine decoupling and we have two versions. One version of vehicle which is A which can completely decouple both the electric machine and the combustion engine. And there's another configuration that doesn't have the full. All practical control strategies have engine shut off when the torque at the wheels are negative or zero. So when we have regenerative braking, when we would have engine brake, it's possible to turn off the engine and use that for regenerative braking. And when we're at standstill, it's no use of having the engine on. Then we can have coasting and braking. Next, we look at different ways of uh, designing supervisory control algorithms. We can have non-causal controllers. That means that they use information about the future driving conditions. We can know position, speed, altitude, traffic situation. The uses of non-causal controllers are analysis of the optimal behavior, for example, on regulatory dry cycles like you have done with hand in assignment number two. Then you're using optimal control in a non-causal way because you know everything about the future. It has its practical applicability. For example, if you have public transportation where you know the bus lines, you know the stops, so you can do planning beforehand. You also have long haulage operation of trucks that are going on the same route again and again. There you can also use that information to do planning. And if you have entered a GPS route for your trip, then you can can also use that for knowing about the future. Then you have causal controllers, then you don't have any knowledge about the future. So you have to use information about the current state only. And this is the normal control online in vehicles without planning. I should say that planning is something that is coming very strongly because you can have a lot of benefits from making the planning available. And then you can utilize the energy management in a much better way. So many companies are working on this 
Another classification, heuristic controllers, they are usually causal. They depend on heuristic rules that are developed to mimic the optimal behavior. And this is what's state of the art in most prototypes and mass production vehicles. Then we have optimal controllers, like you have worked with in dynamic programming. They are often non-causal because you use the future information to look at the optimality. Some causal solutions exist and that we will look at later in this lecture. It's ECMS, equivalent consumption minimum strategy. Now we have suboptimal controllers that use some optimization to solve smaller sub problems so that it gets more time efficient to solve the total problem by decomposing it into small problems. Often they are causal and there is ongoing work to include optimal controllers in production vehicles. For example, both Volvo Trucks and the Scania Truck Company have solutions that look at map information and use that to calculate to determine the driving schedule, very much like the truck extra task for hand in assignment number two, to plan an uphill and plan downhills. Some short comments about the problem is that we have, it's a very important problem for the industry. It's an area of competition. They are competing with fuel economy when they are competing for the customers. It's a very difficult problem, so there is not yet a solution to it. And there's a lot of research being done and there's a rich body of engineering reports and research papers on the subject. And this you can clearly see when you read chapter 7. And it has also been the main research areas for Lina Guzella and Antonia Charetta, the authors of the book. They work together on hybrid vehicles. Lina was one of the first to start working with control of hybrid vehicles and Antonia Charetta joined the team. And they have been working together on analytical solutions for optimal control. So now we come to heuristic control approach which is more or less state-of-the-art in production vehicles right now. The operation of the heuristic controllers is that they usually depend on a few vehicle operation variables. Then they are rule-based, so there are often nested if-then-else clauses. For example, if velocity is smaller than a low threshold, then use the electric motor, for example, while launching the vehicle from a traffic light. And else you have another condition. They can also be fuzzy logic based, so you have classification of the operating condition in fuzzy sets and then rules for control output in each mode and then the fuzzification gives you the control output. An example of how this can look like is here, where we have a parallel hybrid vehicle with electric assist. In this case we're looking at four different variables. We have the torque that we would like to have. Then we have the vehicle velocity, then in this side we have power, and then we have the state of charge. So for these domains, uh, you can recognize down here the characteristics of the electric machine, and you can see also the characteristics of the electric machine up here, where we do the driving, so driving and braking. And while we're doing driving and braking in these cases, we use the all electric, so low vehicle velocity taking off, all electric, and then when we come up, we turn on the engine and we run combustion engine. And up here we have boosting, so we have electric support to get better acceleration performance. And as you can see here, when we go outside the electric machine range, we have to switch over to active braking so that we are utilizing the friction brakes also. In this side we have the state of charge and we have the power and with the state of charge it's more probable that we will use the electricity from the electric machine. So here we have all electric driving and then when the state of charge is uh, decreasing and when we're coming to very low state of charge then we do recharging while driving. If we have fairly high power requirement, we use electric boosting in the active braking down here in the power domain. We need to use the friction brake because the battery and the electric machine cannot take up more power. So the control output has a function of some selected variables. We have the vehicle speed, engine speed, state of charge, power demand, motor speed. We can also have temperature of the batteries. For example, temperature of the battery is extremely important for the lifetime of the battery. We have vehicle acceleration, we have torque demand that come into play and influence the decisions that are made with respect to what we should utilize to propel the vehicle. The heuristic control approaches are easy to conceive, they are relatively easy to implement and the results will depend on the thresholds that are set in the um, algorithms. Proper tuning of these thresholds can give very good fuel consumption reduction and charge sustainability, uh, but performance varies with cycle and driving conditions, so they are not necessarily robust against all variations that you could see. And it's also very time consuming to develop 
and tune them for advanced hybrid configurations when you have many degrees of freedom you get a lot of different rules that can come in and influence the solution so now we come to optimal control strategies but i think that it's a good time to take a first short break and refresh ourselves and get ready for the next part of the lecture so see you back in a bit